Hi. The future of machine learning and AI is self-supervised. One question I've been asking myself for many years is how do humans and animals learn? In particular, how do they learn so quickly, uh, seemingly not requiring any supervision or very little and uh, almost no interaction with the world? This is a chart put together by Emmanuel Dupou that shows at what age babies learn basic concepts like object permanence, stability, and intuitive physics, inertia, gravity, and things like this. Uh, this seemingly is uh, being learned almost with no interaction with the world, mostly by observation. Uh, the, the young babies have very little ability to interact uh, directly with the world. And the mystery is um, how does that happen? And how does it happen in uh, animals as well? Uh, this is probably the vehicle through which uh, baby animals and humans learn massive amounts of background information about the world, such as intuitive physics and things of that type. Uh, perhaps the accumulation of this knowledge uh, forms the basis of common sense. So being able to reproduce this type of learning in machines would be uh, uh, enormously, enormously powerful, would uh, reduce the requirement for label samples and trials, and in my opinion, the next revolution in AI will uh, not be supervised nor reinforced. Um, so there are really kind of three challenges in uh, deep learning AI and machine learning today. Um, one is, of course, diminishing the requirement for label samples and reinforcement uh, uh, interactions. Uh, and in my opinion, that goes through self-supervised learning, as I just mentioned. Self-supervised learning really is learning dependencies between variables, learning to fill in the blanks. Uh, learning to represent the world, learning to predict. The second one is learning to reason, uh, going beyond system one, uh, Daniel Kahneman's system one, which is uh, not going through kind of a fixed uh, number of steps in a feed-forward neural net, but being able to sort of reason, perhaps by uh, finding a configuration of uh, variables that satisfy a certain number of constraints or minimize some sort of energy or maximize some uh, likelihood. And the third one is uh, learning to plan complex action sequences. And I don't have much to say about this, unfortunately. So what is self-supervised learning? Self-supervised learning is learning to fill, the, fill in the blanks. Uh, let's take an example of a video. You, the, mach the machine pretends not to know a piece of that video and train itself to predict the piece that it pretends not to know from the piece that it knows. So for example, predicting the future from the past, uh, predict, predicting the top from the bottom, predicting missing frames, things like that, or missing words in the text, as is, of course, uh, becoming very popular. Um, so um, the problem with this is that the prediction must be multimodal. There is no single prediction that will be consistent with an initial segment of a video. Multiple future of the video are, are possible. Uh, so we cannot use just uh, a neural net that is basically a deterministic function symbolized by this sort of rounded shape blue uh, uh, block here, g of x, uh, which makes a single point prediction. We have to replace this by something that can make multiple prediction. And one way to do this is to go through some an, an implicit function that basically measures the compatibility between the variable we observe x and the variable we need to predict y. So this uh, function f of xy uh, we'll take low values is if x and y are compatible with each other and higher value if y is incompatible with x, if it's not a good continuation for the video, for example. Um, the symbolism I'm using here is very similar to uh, factor graphs in uh, graphical models, except for this extra symbol of deterministic function. Now, I'm going to advocate to use energy-based models, uh, which you know basically measure the compatibility between x and y through this energy function. Again, that takes low value if x and y are compatible and higher value if, if, uh, if they're not. Uh, inference uh, is performed by, uh, for a given x, finding y's that minimize this energy. Uh, there could be multiple y's. Uh, and this is a way of uh, handling uncertainty without resorting to probabilities. Um, inference can be done if the function f is smooth in y space, can be done through uh, gradient-based uh, uh, optimization algorithms or some other uh, inference uh, methods. Uh, of course, is why is discrete is much easier and we know how to deal with that. Um, there are conditional and, and unconditional versions of energy-based models. In conditional version, the variable x is the one that's always known and y is the one that's always needs to be predicted. In the unconditional version, uh, the, the trick here is to train the machine to predict part of y from, part, from other parts of y, but we never know which one is known, which one is unknown. Uh, so this is sort of a, 
capturing the mutual dependencies between the, the variables as uh, symbolized by the, uh, the drawing here on the, uh, uh, on the left, on the bottom left, that, that represents the uh, energy function in this case here learned with k-means where the, the training samples are drawn on this little uh, uh, purple uh, curve. Um, so one way to handle multiple outputs is to is through the use of a latent variable. So uh, if we're going to build our machine out of uh, deterministic functions, the, the way to allow a machine to produce multiple outputs for a single input is to parameterize the set of outputs through a latent variable. So the typical architecture would look something like this. You have an X variable that goes through a predictor that extracts a representation of that X variable. And that representation together with a latent variable go through a decoder, which produces the prediction. When you vary the latent variable over a set, it makes the prediction vary over uh, a set of uh, similar dimension. And the trick, of course, is to find, uh, uh, build a machine and train it in such a way that the latent variable represent independent explanatory factors of variation of the output. Um, the information capacity of this latent variable must be minimized or regularized, and this is a main issue that I will discuss uh, later. Um, now, many energy-based models are actually uh, built using latent variables, and you can uh, reduce a uh, latent variable energy-based model to one that doesn't have one by either marginalizing or minimizing with respect to the latent variable. So uh, inference, of course, uh, takes place by minimizing the elementary energy function with respect to both y and z, the variable to be predicted and the latent variable. But you can simply redefine the energy function f by minimizing the elementary energy function e with respect to z, or by marginalizing, which is equivalent to computing some sort of free energy uh, as indicated here, uh, the logarithm of the integral of exponential minus the energy where the integral takes place over the domain of z. Uh, but this may turn out to be uh, impractical or intractable or only approximated through variational methods uh, in practice. So um, an example of latent variable, let's say our data manifold is an ellipse. Uh, what we, um, when we find a data point, we need to compute its energy by finding the point on the manifold that is closest to it so that we measure the distance to the manifold. And the latent variable would be the angle uh, that leads to the point, the closest point on that manifold. Uh, now, in this simple case, of course, you can write it explicitly. But in more complex cases, uh, of course, we need to find this manifold. And the parameterization is non-trivial. OK, so how do we train energy-based models? What we need to do is make sure the energy for data samples is lower than the energy outside uh, of the data manifold. Um, and um, there's two types of methods for this. Contrastive methods that explicitly push down on the data points and push up on other points outside the data manifold, or maybe on it, but less uh, strongly. And then there is regularized and architectural methods that essentially limit the volume of space uh, in, in Y space that can take low energy and therefore kind of shrink wrap the uh, data manifold uh, automatically without having to push up. So we're going to explore uh, some of those. I make a big list here. I'm not going to read through all of this, but a big list of classical methods that can be interpreted in, the, in this context, either as contrastive methods or architectural method. Uh, maximum likelihood in, in um, uh, uh, distributions that are not easily normalized is actually uh, part of contrastive methods. Uh, and um, uh, which is what I'm, I'm going to talk about first. So there is an issue with probabilistic methods, which you can, of, of course, uh, almost always turn an energy function into a probability distribution using a Gibbs distribution. And you can do maximum likelihood. But you basically have to do maximum likelihood if you want estimates of densities. The problem is that estimating densities is not necessarily a good idea. Because uh, by doing maximum likelihood, what the system wants to do is give the lowest possible energy to data points and the highest possible energy to, point, to points just outside of the data manifold, um, which leads the system to create to creating uh, extremely deep, narrow canyons. And those are not uh, particularly useful for inference. We need smooth functions. So those functions would need to be regularized, for example, by a prior or another regularizer. Um, but then we lose the advantage of actually estimating densities. We're not estimating densities anymore. So why not throw away? Uh, the probability framework altogether and just learn dependency through an energy function. Uh, 
So uh, throwing away the, the probabilistic framework sort of allows us to uh, use more freedom in sort of deciding on what uh, objective function to use. Um, the characteristic of the objective function is that it must be a, an increasing function of the energy of data points and a decreasing function of the energy of points outside the data manifold, and perhaps through some sort of margin that depends on those two points. Uh, there are several forms for those energies. I'm not going to go to the details, but they've been used in various contexts over the over the years, either for things like Siamese networks or metric learning, uh, or for ranking or um, or, or embedding. Um, and then more recently, there's been uh, objective functions that use not just a pair of points, but uh, a whole set of points that are either uh, positive or contrastive. So points on the manifold or outside. Uh, so a good example of this is noise contrastive estimation, which is very popular now in uh, sort of uh, embedding methods, which I'm going to talk about uh, in a minute. Um, so obviously, there's very successful applications of uh, self-supervised learning today, in particular in the context of natural language processing. Everybody knows about uh, BERT. Uh, this was preceded by the colbert weston set of techniques, uh, which used uh, a form of denoising autoencoder where you take an input, you corrupt it, and then you train the system to distinguish between the clean version and the corrupted version. In denoising autoencoder, you train the system to map corrupted version to clean versions. Therefore, now the reconstruction error for corrupted uh, points is the distance between the corrupted point and this clean version. And so you have automatically an energy surface that grows with the distance to the manifold as represented here on the bottom uh, right. Uh, this represents the vector field of uh, the, basically the gradient field of the energy function uh, produced by um, denoising autoencoder. So this has been incredibly successful in the context of NLP. Uh, the problem is, uh, it doesn't quite uh, work in the context of images, and, and there's been sort of a lot of work in trying to sort of use self-supervised learning to learn good features in images. And it's only in recent years that those systems have been, uh, those attempts have been somewhat successful at actually giving good features. They're based on uh, uh, what's called contrastive embedding or Siamese networks. The idea is you show uh, a system uh, an image X and the image uh, Y that would be compatible to it would be a distortion of that image that doesn't basically change its content. And you train the networks to produce uh, 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 similar outputs, similar vectors, or perhaps even identical outputs. And then the contrastive, the contrastive samples consist of, of showing two images that are, are different and then pushing the two vectors uh, apart. Uh, there's been successful applications of this to face recognition but Tagman et al. Uh, many years ago, but um, and, and earlier examples of Siamese net for various applications. More recently, though, uh, the techniques Pearl by, by Ishan Misra, Moko by Kaming Hun, his collaborators, and SimClear by the team uh, from Google have shown that you can learn uh, good visual features using those techniques. However, um, the cost, the computational cost of these methods is very high because there's many ways to be different, for two images to be different. And for this to succeed, the amount of computation and training is absolutely enormous, even for relatively small data sets. So I think ultimately those methods actually are not the best um, and uh, won't, won't scale to really very, very large uh, representation vectors. You can interpret GANs also as um, uh, um, contrastive methods, uh, basically where the, the data points are, are pushed down, particularly the, the sort of energy-based formulation of GANs, energy-based GANs, where you push down on the energy of data points and then you push up on the energy of chosen points and those points are generated by the generator network that is trained to produce points that progressively get closer to the manifold so as to shape the energy function. Now, GANs can use any kind of uh, objective function as long as, again, it's a decreasing function of the data points and an increasing function of the generated points. And there is some sort of margin that you can guarantee. Um, so a lot of classical algorithms can be interpreted in the context of energy-based learning. Um, uh, uh, and here I'm going to talk about a few architectural and regularized methods, particularly regularized method. So the idea of regularized uh, latent variable method is to regularize the volume of stuff that can take uh, low energy, the volume of Y space uh, uh, that uh, can take low energy. And you do this by regularizing the information capacity of a latent variable. A good example of this is sparse coding. Um, so 
that's the that, that's the principle I'm gonna. Uh, so this is uh, 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 sparse coding and and kind of and sparse autoencoders and variational autoencoders interpreted in the context of uh, regularized latent variable methods. So in the context of sparse coding, you linearly reconstruct a vector uh, by uh, finding a, a, a vector, uh, a latent vector that is sparse, kind of minimizes a particular uh, regularizer here, the L1 norm. Um, and then you can train the decoder to uh, maximally reconstruct uh, training samples. The thing is, uh, because the capacity of the latent variable is limited, there's only a limited volume of white space that the system can exactly or properly reconstruct. And so automatically, when you make the energy low at certain points, it becomes high outside. Um, similarly, for regularized autoencoders, so regularized autoencoders are autoencoders where, the again, the information capacity of the latent code is limited, either through sparsity or something similar, or by adding noise to it. So the, the, the idea of variational autoencoders is just to add noise to the, to the code and to limit the amplitude of the codes so that the information capacity overall of the code is, uh, is limited. And you can interpret them as uh, a latent variable uh, uh, energy-based model in which you uh, approximately sample the latent variable through, um, uh, 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 I mean, you approximately integrate uh, or marginalize over the latent variable uh, through sampling. Um, so those techniques uh, uh, work very well with simple decoders. And uh, I think a, a, a big uh, challenge of the next few years is to try to make them work with sort of deep uh, representations uh, as well. Now, there are other types of regularization that uh, lead to kind of good representations, in particular uh, things that exploit uh, a graph of similarity or perhaps a, a temporal continuity. So things like uh, learning uh, uh, temporally invariant uh, representations or making them linearly predictable. Uh, this is work by uh, my student, uh, Ross Goroshin, a few years ago, or by minimizing the, the curvature of the trajectory followed in the representation space. Uh, this work by Olivier Naff uh, for his PhD at NYU. Um, and uh, having sort of decoders uh, to reconstruct from the input alleviates the need to have contrastive samples. Uh, again, this works really well. It learns really beautiful features. It's not clear that those features are useful in sort of a deep uh, convolutional net context yet, uh, but that's again a challenge for the next few years. Um, so we can use conditional versions of those uh, systems to do video prediction and perhaps uh, get machines to learn some structure about the world. Uh, so a good example of this is some work that we published at iClear a couple of years ago, which consists in learning one of those variational autoencoders or regularized autoencoder, conditional autoencoder type architecture to predict what cars around you are going to do. Um, so to be able to learn a policy for driving, it's good to be able to predict what cars around you are going to do. And of course, it's not deterministic. So uh, you have to have a latent variable model so that you can vary the latent variable um, uh, to make multiple predictions. Uh, this system used a combination of variational autoencoder type uh, sampling as well as another regularization that uh, is basically equivalent to um, global dropout. So half the time we tell the system, your latent variable is zero, make the, mess, the, make the best uh, prediction possible. So these are the result. You get blurry predictions if you don't use a latent variable, but you get much better prediction shown on the right here by sampling the latent variable with different values. You get sort of realistic predictions that are all very different. Uh, on the left here is the recorded uh, video. Um, We're using this, in fact, to train a forward model of the world. So the, the, the trick here is to um, have a way of predicting what the world is going to do that you can use in the context of a model predictive control uh, system. Uh, this is not reinforcement learning because everything is differentiable, uh, including the objective function, the cost. So we uh, estimate the state of the world, run our forward model. This is not the real world. This is our model. It's differentiable. It's a neural net. Um, and for each new state, uh, we give it a proposal uh, action, and we sample a latent variable not represented here. We can compute the cost. And through backprop, we can train a policy network to learn to generate an opti optimal sequence of action that will minimize the overall cost over an entire trajectory. Um, 
So this is uh, very similar to uh, model predictive control, except that we don't uh, infer uh, a sequence of uh, uh, actions. We train a policy network to produce the action from, from the state. Um, and having the ability to kind of uh, generate multiple features is absolutely essential. So uh, this system can be trained to uh, uh, drive uh, cars with uh, some level of reliability. So this is an example. The blue car here is driven by your agent. Uh, it's actually invisible to the other cars, so it has to avoid getting squeezed. And uh, the white dot indicates the, the control uh, on the car, acceleration, braking, and rotation. Okay, con conclusions and conjectures. Uh, Self-supervised learning is learning dependencies, as I just said. There's a take-home message. Reasoning through vector representation and energy minimization might be a way to make reasoning compatible with deep learning and with uh, energy-based uh, learning. Uh, the main obstacle is dealing with uncertainty in high-dimensional continuous spaces. This is not a problem with NLP and BERT because we can discretize uh, the space. The space of uh, uh, words is, is discrete. But it is a problem in uh, high dimensional continuous spaces like video. Um, so predicting points is, is insufficient. Predicting a distribution is intractable. So we have to resort to energy-based models. These are weaker than distributions. And we have two options to train those, contrastive methods and regularized latent variable methods. Uh, my money is on regularized latent variable energy-based models. I think those uh, eventually will uh, uh, overtake all the other methods. Uh, this is not the case at the moment, though. Uh, could energy-based uh, self-supervised learning be the basis for common sense? This is our best bet at the moment, possibly. Uh, animals and humans learn largely uh, self-supervised, and uh, scaling up supervised learning and reinforcement learning will not take us to human-level AI. Uh, and by the way, there is no such thing as artificial general intelligence. Intelligence is specialized, including human intelligence. It's very specialized. And so I think it makes more sense to talk about rat-level, cat-level, or human-level intelligence rather than uh, AGI. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Joshua Bengio, and I'm going to tell you about future directions for deep learning, in particular about deep learning priors associated with conscious processing. So consciousness has been studied in neuroscience and cognitive neuroscience with a lot of progress in the last couple of decades. And I think it's time for machine learning to consider these advances and incorporate them in machine learning models. This can also be helpful for consciousness research by helping to formalize and test specific hypothesized functionalities of consciousness, help to get some of the magic out of consciousness, understand the evolutionary advantage of consciousness, the computational and statistical advantage, for example, I'll tell you, tell you about systematic generalization. And of course, provide these same advantages that we believe humans have to learning agents as well. So to understand this, let me talk about two kinds of systems that Daniel Kahneman, Kahneman described very clearly in his book, Thinking Fast and Slow. The system one tasks and system two tasks. So system one tasks, imagine you're driving in a known path um, and you don't actually have to give all your attention to the driving. Somebody can talk to you and you can respond. Uh, system two tasks require your full attention, your full conscious attention. And if you're driving in a new place that requires you to think, to plan, uh, you don't want someone to talk to you at the same time. System one tasks involve intuitive knowledge. They can be executed quickly in an unconsciously they, they happen in one step in parallel in your brain. Um, usually they are hard to explain verbally and they can be executed in a habitual way. They regard implicit knowledge. And this is where current deep learning is good. What we want to extend is, what we want to do is to extend deep learning to also handle system two tasks, which are executed slowly, uh, sequentially, in a conscious way, can be described verbally. Uh, for example, everything algorithmic involving reasoning or planning and explicit knowledge. One interesting property of system two tasks and conscious processing in general is that they 
allow to manipulate high-level semantic concepts, which can then be recombined combinatorially in, in novel situations. So there's a connection to out-of-distribution generalization, like in my driving example. So first of all, it's considered that the knowledge that we have in our brain about the world can be more or less separated into two kinds, the implicit knowledge and the verbalizable knowledge. And my main message is that the verbalizable knowledge is a special kind of knowledge that satisfies some assumptions that we should try to uncover and describe so we can put them in machine learning architectures and training frameworks. Also, the, this knowledge is organized around concepts that we can name with language. And so there's a strong connection between that research and building better natural language understanding, for example. So what kind of priors could help extend deep learning uh, to incorporate the kind of um, um, structure that exists for these uh, high-level concepts and system two tasks? So one of the first priors that I'll talk about in my presentation is regarding the structure of the joint distribution between those high-level, let's call them semantic variables. The joint distribution can be described by a graphical model, in particular a factor graph, which is sparse, meaning that the pieces of knowledge um, uh, each involve very few variables. In addition, those variables are of, often have something to do with causality. They're about agents, they're about intentions or actions, and they're about controllable objects. Another hypothesis that I almost already gave you earlier is that there's a simple relationship between those high-level variables and um, words or phrases. Um, and so there's a simple relationship between conscious thoughts and words and sentences in general. We can express our conscious thoughts. One assumption that I won't have time to talk a lot about, but is very clear, for example, in, in programming or in, in uh, logical thinking, is that those pieces of knowledge can be reused. Think of them as rules that can be applied across many instances, which you can think of as like arguments of functions. And because of this, this system two computation can deal with variables and interaction. Another very important point about that uh, type of uh, um, data and, and variables is how it changes over time, how the distribution changes over time. And um, I'm going to tell you later about those distributional changes, which we're going to assume are due to causal interventions. And because of this, they involve um, a local change in, in, in the structure of the joint distribution. Maybe just one variable has changed or one condition has changed. And that only works because those variables have a causal semantic. So it's connected to this earlier prior that I mentioned. In addition, when there's a change in distribution, um, most of the rest of the joint distribution doesn't change as well as the relationship between our observations, sensory data, low-level actions, and, and the high-level variables. So the only thing that changes when there's an intervention is uh, some, some property or some values of high-level variables, but not their relationship to uh, low-level perception. Finally, um, another assumption that I won't have time to talk much about is about how we reason and plan and do credit assignment with respect to these variables. Um, so the, the, the assumption here is that credit assignment only involves short causal change at each, uh, each time we do such a credit assignment. All right, so now let's talk about what is maybe 
um, the most interesting property of system two cognition, and that is the ability to do what is called systematic generalization. This is something that was studied a lot in linguistics, where humans can dynamically recombine existing concepts to form uh, a new concepts. Uh, it could be verbal, but it could be visual, like in this example from Lake et al., where different types of vehicles are combined to form a, a new one. What's interesting is that uh, this recombination allows us to explain observations that we, not only we have never seen, but they have zero probability under our training distribution. Like if I tell you a science fiction scenario, or you're driving in an unknown, an unknown city where uh, the way to drive is very different. Up to now, what we have observed experimentally in a number of papers is that when there are such changes in distribution, current deep learning system don't perform very well and they tend to overfit to the training distribution, not just the training data. And so we have issues of transfer that doesn't work as well as what humans seem to be able to do. Now, how is that related to the symbolic AI program, the classical AI, good old fashioned AI? Well, we'd like to get the best of both worlds. We want to avoid the pitfalls of classical AI rule-based symbolic manipulation. Um, we want to keep some of the things we have achieved with deep learning up to now. So efficient large-scale learning, semantic grounding in system one uh, uh, knowledge representation, all of that implicit knowledge I talked about. Uh, we want to keep distributed representations. For example, symbols would be represented by vectors so that we get better generalization. And we want search, which is something that mostly happens on the system two side, to take advantage of the power of system one, to guide the search and, and thus to be efficient. And finally, of course, one of the advantages of uh, modern machine learning that we want to keep is the ability to handle uncertainty properly. But we want some of the advantages that are associated with system two. I mentioned systematic generalization. That's connected to a knowledge representation idea that knowledge can be factorized and, and uh, decomposed into small exchangeable pieces. In that uh, we can manipulate variables, instances, references, and indirection. One of the important messages of this talk is that in the last few years in deep learning, we have made progress with tools such as soft attention, which might be a key to a transition from the old deep learning, where we process vectors, fixed size vectors, to this extended deep learning in which we actually manipulate sets um, and we can uh, focus on a few elements at a time. Soft attention had a huge impact on natural language processing, starting with machine translation. Um, it allows us to learn where to attend. Um, and uh, some interesting neuroscience results suggest that this attention is like an internal muscle, an internal action, and that it's processed in the brain in a similar way. It allows neural nets to operate on sets, um, and it's at the heart of several theories from neuroscience about consciousness, in particular, the global workspace theory, um, mostly uh, put forward by Bars, but also by the hand and, and, and their collaborators, involves a bottleneck of conscious processing. So information is selected with attention from uh, many possible modalities and, and uh, parts of the input and the selected items are then broadcast to the rest of the brain, as well as stored in short-term memory to condition um, uh, processing, perception, and action in, in the short term. And this enables sequential processing, conscious reasoning, planning, and imagination. One interesting thing to note here is that if we think of the brain a uh, particular cortex as uh, a big simulation engine that um, 
uh, can enroll some, some kind of imagined future, it does so in a very special way. It's not like a movie. Um, it, it focuses on a few aspects of, of the movie at a time, at each step of this uh, simulation. So the, the connection between consciousness and language is very strong. In fact, this is almost uh, the way in which we know that some event is conscious versus unconscious, and that is that people can uh, report it verbally. Um, now, it's also important to understand that we need to tie those high-level representations with uh, lower-level um, perception. If we, there's a lot of knowledge about the world that cannot be represented uh, with those strong assumptions uh, I've been talking about. And so in order to understand language, we need to have both kinds of knowledge involved. So this gives rise to research in things like grounded language learning. So let me talk about this very basic prior uh, in my list, which I, I called in 2017, the consciousness prior. The idea is that the joint distribution of these high-level variables is sparse. So if you think of the joint as represented by a factor graph, think of each factor involving a few variables like a sentence. What is, there's there's a, an amazing property of high-level knowledge like this, which is that in a single sentence, I can make a probabilistic prediction that is very strong, that has a high probability of being true in spite of the fact that it involves very few variables. So if I say, if I drop the ball, it would fall on the ground. Um, I can make a very strong prediction, but it involves only a handful of concepts. So now this is different from the common assumptions of uh, marginal independence, where we assume that high-level variables are independent. Uh, instead, we have these dependencies, for example, ball and hand are not independent. And this also connects to the notion of attention I just talked about, because when you want to do inference over such a sparse graph, a reasonable way of doing it is to uh, focus on a one or a few factors at a time, just uh, traveling in, in that graph in order to iteratively uh, change some, um, some, some inferences. Now let's talk about the assumptions regarding how things may change in distribution. This is a very, very important hypothesis that I think provides some of the great power of conscious processing. So, so the picture you should have in your mind is this raw data, which has a very complex joint distribution, but we're going to represent it with two levels. There's a encoder that maps that raw data to an abstract space, these high-level semantic variables. And what happens when there's a change in distribution, according to this hypothesis, is that in that abstract space, the change is localized. Maybe just one variable, one conditional, or one factor needs to be modified. As a consequence, it becomes much easier to learn um, uh, how to adapt to the modified distribution. So you can have fast transfer if you represent information in the right way. Um, what causes these changes is that, um, you know, most likely it's because an agent has done something in the world and agents can only do things in a localized way because of physics. Actions are localized in space and time. So, for example, if I put on my dark glasses, at a high level, it's only one bit that changed, but at the low level, you know, all of the pixels have now a, a different joint distribution. So the advantage of, of this is that if we have this uh, good high-level model, we can generalize faster, but we can turn this around and we can um, uh, use the speed of adaptation as a meta-learning objective in order to learn a good high-level representation. I'll come back to that. Um, so we actually tried this idea in, in simple settings, first with uh, two variables, A and B, 
where you learn through changes in distribution that involve uh, an intervention on, on, on one of the variables. And we find that the speed of learning is a good clue for um, uh, whether you have the right hypothesis, the right set of high-level variables, and whether A should be the cause of B or B should be the cause of A. We've recently uh, extended that work uh, uh, in, in, on the theory side to prove when this uh, uh, speed of adaptation uh, allows to converge to uh, the, the, the right um, causal hypotheses. We've also extended it in the direction of larger graphs, not just two variables, um, dealing with the fact that the number of such graphs is exponentially large. Um, by parametrizing the graph uh, efficiently through its edges. And uh, we've shown that you can do fast causal discovery using this method. Um, the last bit of work I want to mention that uh, rides on some of these hypotheses, in particular the uh, decomposition of knowledge into pieces that can be recombined dynamically is uh, a, a paper called Recurrent Independent Mechanisms, where in, we define a new recurrent neural net architecture in which instead of having a homogeneous network, we break the recurrent net into smaller modules where inside each module it's fully connected. But between modules, there's a attention mechanism, which you can think is where consciousness is focusing that selects which module is talking to which module and uh, each module is sending key value pairs so essentially variables that have a name um, a type as well as a value um, and uh, what we find is that this kind of architecture leads to better out of distribution generalization so let me summarize and conclude in this brief talk, I've tried to uh, sketch a direction of research for deep learning towards capturing not just system one um, knowledge, but also system two knowledge. And what I find is that this involves many interesting research aspects um, from Things like out of distribution generalization and systematic generalization, representation of knowledge in a modular way that, that allows um, on the fly compositional uh, dynamic um, uh, computation. Um, this connects to meta learning because we can learn the stable part of the knowledge as well as how to on the fly combine those pieces together. This relates to cognition and neuroscience, especially of attention, reasoning, and consciousness. And it relates to agency and non-stationarity. The priors can be listed, and I'm sure we'll find more, but uh, maybe the central prior is this idea, well, two central priors that I've tried to highlight is one, that knowledge can be decomposed into recombinable pieces corresponding to dependencies involving very few variables at a time. And that the way that knowledge changes over time is uh, local, involving interventions that involve only one or a few variables at a time. So, um, this is interesting because it allows an agent to learn faster how to adapt to a change in distribution or maybe even just to inference in order to discover the reasons why the change happened. Um, it connects to natural language. It connects to the problem of discovering causal dependencies. Uh, it connects to the question of how meaning in natural language uh, should be associated with both 
the system one knowledge that re relates perception to those high level variables and how these high level variables interact with each other in this very structured way. Thank you very much.